Good morning, Grace Center. And if you're watching online or watching this video, good morning to you as well. And we're glad to have you with us. And I just want to take a moment to wish you a Merry Christmas. And I'm sorry that I'm not with you in house in the pr here uh, at Grace Center this week. But <clears throat> I am out with my children in North Carolina helping my son and just spend some time with my son and his family. And there's a good possibility I am preaching right now at this moment somewhere out there. At the same time, I'm preaching to you here on the video. So uh, just appreciate you excusing me for the day. We've been in a two-part mini-series called Kingdom Matters. And I want to talk, I just want to pick up the second part. I gave you installment number one last week. And we talked about the political nature, uh, uh, the political time, and the political unrest and upheaval that was taking place in the world in which Christ was born into. And there were the Roman Empire was was the power was the world power on the scene. It had uh, conquered the known world at that time, and uh, the Israelites were looking for Messiah. They were looking for a Messiah who would come and set up a literal kingdom to liberate them from Roman rule and oppression. Of course, Jesus came and answered that prayer, but as he does in many cases, he answered exceeding abund abundantly above what they asked and thought, and he delivered a spiritual kingdom and left it in the earth, a kingdom who Isaiah said that the increase of that government. In fact, that's where I want to start this morning in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7. <coughs> Isaiah 9, verse 6 and 7. And then we're going to jump over to Luke chapter 2 and read the Christmas story. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Now let me just pause right there for a second because there have been many governments powers, empires, and kingdoms that have come on the scene over the years, but all of them faded off the scene as well. But one thing that differentiates his kingdom, being a spiritual kingdom and being the kingdom of God, is that of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. There'll be no fading away. In fact, it is increasing day by day. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Now let's go over to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, and let's read the story of the birth of Jesus and tie these two in together and talk a little bit about his government and his kingdom and the impact and the implications that it has in our life as well. Luke chapter 2 and verse 1. In those days, uh, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. Now, this was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. When she gave birth to her firstborn, a son, she wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, be not afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Now, if you caught last week's message, you remember that I said, after 450 years of silence, when Malachi the prophet talked about uh, judgment coming and closed that book out, 450 years had gone by. They had gone through all the routines and all the motions, but heaven hadn't been speaking through any prophets into the earth for 450 years, and so none that's recorded anyway. And so heaven finally breaks the ice like a father whose mercy triumphs over justice or judgment and says, be not afraid, I'm not mad at you, I'm madly in love with you, and in fact, I've got good news for you. So <clears throat> verse 11 says, today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes, lying in a manger. 
Suddenly a great company, the heavenly host, appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. And when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off, and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about the child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. And on the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he was conceived. So let's set the scene here uh, just a little bit. Let's talk about the manger for just a moment. In verse 2, in chapter 2, verse 7, it said, And she brought forth her, for her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes. The Passion Translation that I was just reading from left that out, but most of your Bibles will say swaddling clothes. And they laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And down in verse 12, he told the, shep the shepherds, the angels did, that this would be a sign to you that you'd find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. So... The majesty of this scene is only matched by its simplicity. It's an incredible scene here. The creator of heaven and earth had come to deliver mankind from death, and he was wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger, which was a feed trough in a stable for cattle. Now, swaddling clothes represented a higher... I've heard a lot of people preach a lot of different things over the years, but all of the research that I've done, this is what I can come up with, Swaddling clothes represented a higher quality of material that only those who were wealthy or born into nobility or royalty could typically, typically afford to wrap their babies in. And so in that culture, in that time, when babies were born, they typically stayed naked for the most part, and they didn't have what we would call diapers, and most families couldn't afford any types of clothes to wrap the children in. So typically up until a certain age, till it was no longer proper, they just ran around naked and just washed them off and cleaned them up. But the babies that were, uh, the babies that were uh, born into nobility or into royalty or had relatives that were, <coughs> they were wrapped in, in, in fine linen, fine clothing. They were wrapped in there, wrapped tightly. And so it's possible that a wealthy relative of Mary's gave them to her, just food for thought, perhaps even her cousin Elizabeth, whose husband was a priest. Uh, and the sign to the shepherds was that they were going to find a royal baby or a baby dressed like royalty, but lying in an animal feed trough. So it's one of the first unique pictures that we see of the coming together of divinity and humanity. He's royalty, he's nobility of the highest and purest form from heaven, but here he is in a feed trough. So Let's talk about the, uh, the barn or the, uh, the, the scene where he was born at, okay? In the context of, of culture and history that we know about the time Jesus was born, was this like a stable or was this, was this stable like an old English barn or an early American barn? Did it look anything like that? It's not really likely that it did. And even though that's where our mind wants to wander when we picture it, we're picturing a small barn that, you know, has a nice stack of hay over here and just a bunch of animals in different stalls. But that's really not what it likely, more than likely was. In biblical times, it was probably what they called a booth, such as the ones that they built for the celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles, because it was the time of the celebration of tabernacles or booths when Christ was born. The instructions for that celebration are found all the way back in Leviticus chapter 23. He gives them very specific instructions. If you're taking notes, I won't read them for the sake of time. But Leviticus 23, verse 39 through 43, he gives them very specific instructions on when to celebrate uh, tabernacles, uh, how to celebrate it, how to begin it, when to end it. And he tells them to take branches, tree branches, and, uh, you know, from palms and willows and other leafy trees and put them all together and to make a booth and to live in that booth for seven days. 
It was a temporary shelter, and they were to live in that shelter for seven days. All native-born Israelites were to live in shelters like that for seven days during the celebration of tabernacles. And so it was, it was basically, um, verse 43 of Leviticus says, So your descendants will know that I had the Israelites live in temporary shelters when I brought them out of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So keeping this feast would have resulted in hundreds of these booths in and around Jerusalem and Bethlehem. So just picture that. That's when they come into Bethlehem, into Jerusalem, when they're coming into the city from the country, these booths are everywhere, all over the place, these temporary structures. The Hebrew word for booths is the word sukkoth. It's defined as a booth, a cottage, a covert, a pavilion, get this, a tabernacle or a tent. It's most familiar to us in its usage with the word tabernacle. So these tabernacles also were used for cattle. If you were moving cattle back and forth, you'd need to put a, a temporary shelter up at a certain point. For instance, uh, in Genesis 33, verse 17, it says, and, and Jacob journeyed to Sukkoth and built him a house, and he made booths, and it's the, it's the old Aramaic word Sukkoth, for his cattle. Therefore, the name of the place was called Sukkoth. So from that passage, we know that these booths or these tabernacles were used for sheltering animals, and so that they could, they could have contained a manger or a feed trough. So in biblical context, it's likely that Christ was born in one of these Sukkoths or these tabernacles. So he was an Israelite. He was an Israelite born, so he probably lived there for seven required days fulfilling the law. After the seven days in there, on the eighth day, they took him to be circumcised, verse 21 of Luke chapter 2 says. So Last week, we discussed the relationship between divinity and humanity and how the two were interwoven together in the life of Jesus. And the theological term for God coming in the flesh is called the incarnation, the incarnation. The incarnation was the logos or the word made flesh. Now, I've taught here before that logos is the logic of God the blueprint of God, becoming flesh and living among us, with us, as us, so that we would have the empowerment to live as him. And I said last week, you'll never understand our relationship to divinity until you understand divinity's relationship to humanity. <clears throat> he didn't come from heaven to earth to show us the way back to heaven, even though there's popular songs that say so. That's not the reason he came. Let's be realistic. Let's be transparent and let's be honest about that. Getting us back to heaven has never been a primary concern of his. Uh, he created the earth to be filled with his glory, so he populated the earth with his image bearers. What better way to fill the earth with glory than to populate it with your own image bearers? So the incarnation is God coming from heaven to earth to show us how to be properly human. So it's not about, he didn't come to, from heaven to earth to show us the way back to heaven. I'm just, I'm not being sarcastic or facetious, but I'm just being uh, realistic here. If that were the case, he would have just taken us back to heaven when he went back to heaven. But he came to restore that fallen image in our mindsets so that we could once again begin thinking like God, thinking as God in the earth, so that we could act like and live like his image bearers. So <clears throat> we said last week that the time in which Jesus was born and raised and lived in, it was a tumultuous time in Jerusalem and all of Palestine in the surrounding areas. The, the Roman Empire had conquered most of the known world. The Jews were groaning underneath of Roman rule. They were constantly rebelling. Now, some, some nations settled in under Roman rule, because Rome did bring some good things as well. So they settled in, they, they accepted the domination of Rome, and they enjoyed some peace and some prosperity. The problem is with the Jews is that they knew, they believed in God and Yahweh, and they believed he was their only king, so they were never to be 
in subjection or submission to another kingdom. So they rebelled constantly against Roman oppression, which I'm not going to say was all good because they were a brutal empire as well. They weren't Christian, so even though they had some values and some morals intact, and they believed they were the light of the world, they didn't really possess the light of the world as in Christ himself. And so <clears throat> the religious system that was in operation from the kings down to the priests and the temple leaders, such as the Sadducees and the Pharisees, they were all corrupt, controlling, and conniving. So it wasn't a pretty scene when Jesus was born. When Jesus was born into that region, Palestine was in upheaval. There were rebellions. There were revolts. Pilate was nervous uh, and, and that Caesar was going to come and bring the full weight and authority of Rome down on that region if they didn't calm down. So, And then the system that was meant to display the image of God in the earth was corrupt, controlling, and conniving. So Isaiah the prophet looks down the long corridors of history, and, and by the Spirit he begins to prophesy, and he speaks to the fullness of times. In chapter 40 he says it this way. He says, A voice cries out, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill will be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough place is a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all the people shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Now, a careful look at that text reveals it's not about the Lord preparing something for us. Rather, it's about us preparing something for him. This is about the coming of the Lord of glory into the earth realm, and obviously that initial application was tied to the incarnation, which is part of what we're celebrating in this season we call Advent or Christmas. <clears throat> but there is an application now uh, relevant to the many comings of the Lord, the many appearings of the Lord by the Spirit that are also appointed times of the Lord's dealings in the earth, as well as, and ultimately, his literal, physical second coming the second coming of Christ. So all throughout church history, God's people have wandered astray more than once. They've broken covenant over and over again, and yes, even in Christ, and they've needed to be brought back to that place of preparing the way for the Lord to come and be in their midst. And it was based on their willingness to return to a posture of faithfulness to him and to his word. So by the time you arrive in Isaiah 40, the prophetic utterances have all been about judgment in Zion that would lead to their exile from the land of promise. That first 39 chapters, first 39 chapters of Isaiah were all about judgment, but then the last 27 chapters, almost like a mini Bible within the Bible, 66 books, 39 old and, 20, and 27 pointing towards something new, a new Messiah's kingdom coming. Historically, God uh, led Israel through the wilderness, and he made a way out of no way for his people to experience the Exodus event, and then transitioned them into the wilderness where he, where he fulfilled, where he provided for them without fail. All the way through the wilderness, he always made a way. He always provided for them, but some of them still died in the wilderness under judgment, and I just want to propose to you that one of the reasons why is because they never made the transition from being enslaved to being enthroned. They never made the full transition. Now, whenever Isaiah is prophesying here in 40, they're exiled from the land because they failed to keep God's covenant. They failed to remember and keep his covenant, and as a result, Zion has become a wasteland, a wilderness, a complete wilderness. So then fast forward to the time of Christ. By the time Jesus is born of Mary, Zion is now under the oversight of Herod of Edemia, uh, and, he is, and Herod is, is a king, and he is not of the house of David. He's not a descendant of David. He is from ancient Edom, which is a territory of Esau. So here you have a guy who is sitting on a throne of David, but he's not even of the household of David. He's of the household of Esau. So the, the level of compromise in the holy city of Jerusalem had reached an all-time high. Corruption was rampant everywhere. And if you remember, when Pilate crucified Jesus, the reality of the holy city of Jerusalem having become another Babel, 
which is a place of the confusion of languages, that reality is made clear by the fact that when they crucify Jesus, Pilate writes on a plaque, King of the Jews, but he has to write it in three languages so all the people standing at the foot of the cross can see it. So he writes it in Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. That's in John 19, verse 20. Because the holy city no longer spoke one language, the impact of them having been overrun by the nations and only a remnant of faith remained in Jerusalem and in Israel. So Jerusalem had a painful history of rejecting and murdering the prophets. If you remember in Matthew chapter 22, Matthew 23 actually, verse 37, you hear this in the heart of Jesus. You hear him crying out, weeping for Jerusalem when he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stone those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were unwilling. And that's a picture of him saying, I wanted to pull you up under the feathers, which are seen on the mercy seat, but you're unwilling to come up under my mercy. So the Lord sends John the Baptist, and John the Baptist's message, just like Isaiah prophesied, his message was to prepare the way. He was a messenger to prepare, and his message was to the people, prepare the way for God to become flesh in your life. Prepare the way for the incarnation. Prepare the way for the Messiah. So his preaching was designed to deal with this internal wilderness in the hearts of God's people. So repentance was his message. Repentance was his message. The way of the Lord is glory. It always has been and it always will be glory. His manifested glory. It was one thing for Herod, who was a rebel holder of the throne of David, it was one thing for him to be troubled when he hears the announcement. If you remember the Magi come from the east, the wise men, and it's, it's in Matthew chapter 2 verse 3, and he tells, they tell him, we're here to find him that is born king of the Jews. So it's one thing for Herod to be troubled in his heart because he wasn't pleased that the true heir of David had now been born. So the one who was supposed to be sitting on the throne had now been born. But the perplexing thing is that the, very t the text also says all Jerusalem with him. So it's understandable that he would be troubled. But what had happened to the hearts of the people in the holy city? What had happened to them? Their hearts had become a wilderness and a desert. There were valleys. Valleys represent unhealthy low places in their hearts. There were mountains, which represent unhealthy high places of pride and arrogance and the abuse of power. And then there were rough places that needed to be made level and they needed to be smoothed out. <clears throat> the Pharisees, the Pharisees saw themselves as a cut above the rest of Israel. They ran Jerusalem and they ran the entire system of worship. The priesthood, even though within the priesthood there was a faithful, believing remnant there, even the priesthood had been corrupted. And when you read the story, it's the only conclusion that you can come to. Now, there, now for, for, for an aged, godly man named Simeon, whose story is told in Luke chapter 2, says he was looking for the consolation of Israel. So there was the, the power of presence and abiding witness of the spirit because his heart was where it needed to be to see the glory of the Lord when it came. When you read on down in Luke chapter 2 and it says that they brought him into the temple to dedicate Jesus after he was circumcised, this old precious old man who had prophetic insight, he had postured his heart in the right place, he had, he had prepared the way in his own life for the coming of glory. So when he saw him, he said, now my eyes, now I can go to the grave. Now I can rest because mine eyes have seen him. I've laid my eyes on the, the, the Messiah. And so the, the faithful remnant that was left there, men like Simeon, Anna, Zacharias and Elizabeth, Joseph and Mary and various others, they wanted to prepare the way for the glory of the Lord to be revealed. Uh, they, they, they had repented, they had realigned themselves, they had prepared the way. The rest of the people were on a political, they were on a quest for political power and prestige. The rest were far from prepared. They weren't ready to see or embrace the glory of the Lord at all. 
they knew that their name, but these others, like Simeon and Anna and, and Elizabeth and Zachariah and Joseph and Mary and the faithful remnant that was tucked away, they had aligned themselves, they had humbled their heart, they had postured their heart, they had prepared the way in their own life for glory to come and manifest and become flesh. They knew their nation had been under judgment. They had turned to the Lord in repentance. They lived a life of repentance and, and, and awakened faith. And repentance and faith are always inseparable. You can't have one without the other. They trusted in God. They didn't doubt him. And then you compare that to the Sadducees who had, they didn't have, they didn't trust God. They had no trust that God would even raise the dead, let alone do signs and wonders. And the Pharisees were consumed with love of money. But these people that were waiting in genuine hope, they knew there was a coming of the Lord and they trusted that what they read in the prophets concerning the fullness of time was about to come to pass. So what is it? that you and I need to know today. What are we believing for in our churches, in our homes, in our region, in our nation, and in the earth? <clears throat> the real question for all of us in this Advent season is whether we ourselves have prepared our hearts for a fresh coming or appearing of the Lord. And let me put it this way, for fresh waves of glory to infiltrate our homes and infiltrate our society. And remember, he didn't come to, to get us ready to go somewhere else. He came to reposition us from death to life, from darkness to light, so that we can repent and renew our thinking and learn to live here as his image bearers, the human beings that he created us to be, kingdom conduits in the earth, kingdom conduits that glory flows to, glory feels, and glory flows through. <clears throat> Psalm chapter 22, it's a powerful song, which was also a prophetic psalm of the Messiah from the cross. It's called in some Bibles the, 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 king, of, the king on the cross. And you would recognize the first line of the song because Jesus uttered it on the cross when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Of course, God didn't forsake him, nor did he turn his back on him. And there's a lot of, a lot of uh, bad theology and preaching has come out of that verse because they took one verse, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, and came up with all of these theological reasons why God couldn't look at sin or behold sin. And the truth of the matter is when you read on down in the chapter, the revelation comes, God, you didn't turn your back on me. You didn't take your eyes off of me. You never left me. You were my first responder. You were there on the scene with me in all of my distress. This was a song, and Jesus sung the first line of it from the cross. In that culture and time, everyone standing there that knew their history, that knew the Psalms and the prophets, would have immediately began to sing the rest of the song. So the, the, the first 21st verses of Psalm chapter 22 are all about the oppressive darkness and anguish of the crucifixion. There was, and, and, and he's... He's gushing his emotions in the anguish of it, in the darkness of it, a flood of emotions as he's feeling that he's feeling while he's hung there suspended between heaven and earth. But at verse 22, the message changes, the mission becomes evident, and he begins to prophesy of the future impact that his finished work is going to have on generations. The prophetic implication in the song, in Psalm 22, is that between verse 21 and verse 22, the resurrection of Jesus takes place. And so at verse 22 in the song, the music changes keys. The music goes to a higher key. The pace changes because victory begins to be sounded forth. He makes the reference, my people gather. The reference that he makes there in that verse, my people gather, it's a reference to the church that was birthed through his resurrection glory. Now, let's just read that psalm from 22 on, verse, Psalm chapter 22, verse 22. It says, I will praise your name before all my brothers. As my people gather, I will praise you in the midst. Lovers of Yahweh, praise him. Let all the true seed of Jacob glorify him with your praises. Stand in awe of him, all you princely people, the offspring of Israel. For he has not despised my cries of deep despair. He's my first responder to my sufferings. And he did not look the other way when I was in pain. He was there all the time listening to the song of the afflicted. 
You're the reason for my praise. It comes from you and it goes to you. I will keep my promises to praise you before all who fear you among the congregation of your people. He begins to talk about Messiah's kingdom next. He says, I will invite the poor and the broken and they will come and eat and be satisfied. Bring Yahweh praise and you will find him. Your hearts will overflow with life forever. From the four corners of the earth, the peoples of the world will remember and return to the Lord. Every nation will come and worship him. For the Lord is king of all who takes charge of all the nations. There they are. They're worshiping. The wealthy of this world will feast in fellowship with him right alongside the humble of heart, bowing down to the dust, forsaking their own souls. They will all come and worship this worthy king. His spiritual seed will serve him. Future generations will hear from us about the wonders of the sovereign Lord. His generation yet to be born will glorify him, and they will all declare it is finished. It's a prophetic psalm from the cross of Messiah and his kingdom. What a powerful kingdom picture of everyone at the table of the Lord. Everyone at the table of the Lord. Isaiah 9, 2 says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. John chapter 1, verses 4 and 5 out of the Passion Translation says, life came into being because of him, for his life is light for all humanity. And this living expression is the light that bursts through gloom, the light that darkness could not diminish. Then Jesus spoke about himself in John eight twelve, saying, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. So as we, as we conclude our thoughts here, I want to just remind you that Christmas is the time when we celebrate the birth of Jesus. The incarnation is the representation of light coming into darkness, <clears throat> hope bursting into, uh, into your despair, into your gloom. Christmas is the time where we celebrate the birth of Jesus, which was the entrance of the Word of God into the very world that he created was the entrance of his word, Psalm says, brings light. It's true that Jesus wasn't even born during this time of year in reality, and a lot of people try to act like we shouldn't even be celebrating his birth right now. But listen, <clears throat> he was, I, I, as I said already, he was born during the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths, which would have been around September on our calendar. However, I do want to tell you he was conceived this time of year. He was conceived during the time of year on the Jewish calendar known as Hanukkah or the Feast of Dedication or the Feast of Lights. Now think about that prophetic picture. The light of the world was conceived during the time where the Feast of Lights was taking place. That's when he was conceived. Conception requires or con conception re represents the prophetic in our lives because we, at, at conception, we begin to make room and prepare the way for our lives to be changed dramatically as we get ready to birth new life out of us. So conception is a prophetic act. Scientists have even confirmed now that there is a spark of illuminance, a spark of light at conception that takes place. And you don't wait until your baby comes home before you make preparations in your home, or at least you shouldn't. Uh, you don't wait. You begin immediately. When you find out, when you and your wife find out that you're pregnant, you and your husband find out you're expecting, you immediately begin to do what? Prepare the way. You begin to prepare the way for new life to be birthed in your home. You begin to make adjustments. You begin to make preparations. You begin to make room for him so that God can birth and release new glory through you. Now, that's the picture, the, the prophetic picture is, that, is this, and as we pray together this morning, I want you in your mind right now to envision what areas of your life that you need to make room for him in. What areas do you need to prepare the way in so that God can birth and release new glory through you in this Advent season? I'm excited about 2020. We've only got one more Sunday left after this Sunday. 
in 2019, and we want to highlight some of the journey that God's taken us on, and we want to look forward to some of the journey that he has for us ahead, but I'm excited for 2020, and I believe he wants to birth new expressions of glory through this house, through Grace Center, through our lives, through us as individuals and in our homes and in our families. He wants to birth new expressions of glory, new dimensions of glory, new revelation, fresh revelation and insight, and so we have to pray this morning, and I want you to pray with me. What areas of my life do I need to make room for him in? What areas of my life do I need to prepare the way so that glory can come in me and fill me and flow through me? Because we are, after all, kingdom conduits. So I just want to ask you to grab hands with somebody standing next to you, and I want to lead you in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the word that became flesh and dwelt among us tabernacled among us, Emmanuel, God with us. We are never without the possibility of having hope because God is with us. This morning as, we, as we've been in your word together and your word now has been deposited in us, I just declare that we receive your word with meekness into our lives. James said that, the, that we, when we receive your word with meekness, it's able to save our souls. So I believe, Father God, that our soulish the soulish part of our lives is being saved still. We are saved and we're being saved and we shall be saved. And I believe that that's the part of our life where we make room for you. That's the part of our life where we have to make adjustments in. That's the part of our life where we have to prepare the way for new glory, fresh glory to be released in us and fill us up and release through us. I pray that you would reveal to every one of us, every heart here, every mind here, every couple here, every individual here, Father, and even to us, even to Stacy and I for the Grace Center, reveal to us the areas that we need to prepare the way in, the areas that we need to make room for it. We need to make room for you for new glory, new light to burst on the scene, and for glory, for a fresh appearing, for a, another coming of Christ in our lives in 2020 at the Grace Center and in every one of our hearts and lives here, and even for those watching online as well. So I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would lead us, that you would, you would reveal to us the areas of our life, you would highlight to us the areas of our life where we need to make these accommodations and prepare the way for you and for your glory in a greater way, in a more powerful way. We thank you for the gift, the indescribable gift of your son, Jesus. We thank you and we celebrate that. We celebrate the entrance of light in our lives. And because of that, we no longer have to live in darkness, but we have the light of life living inside of us. In Jesus' name, amen. And from my family to yours, I want to wish you a very Merry Christmas. We love you.